morning. Welcome to this uh, joint congress between the European Economic Association and the Econometric Society here in Europe. Um, the conference has actually really started already since yesterday with a bunch of events this morning, but this is the first kind of plenary event. So uh, in the name of uh, the presidents of the two societies, I want to uh, uh, welcome you all to Barcelona, to the Barcelona School of Economics here at the Pompeu Fabra. It's a great honor for, you know, the locals to organize it here. Uh, we think that um, seeing the number of people who are coming, we have about four, uh, 1,450 people who have uh, uh, who are going to be participating in the conference, so we're very excited about that. There's a lot of content that we uh, uh, want to talk about. We're going to start with a, a, a panel. Before I get into the panel, I also would like to um, uh, thank the people who are organizing it, of course, the, 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 the people from, from the two uh, societies, but also uh, the program chairs uh, from both societies and their whole teams. There's a whole number of people who are being involved in that. Uh, the local organizing uh, committee, uh, all presenters and, and, and participants, and then the people who really have been doing the hard work uh, behind the scenes from both associations, uh, in particular Gemma, Bruno, Thomas, and then the people from the BSC, Bruno, Guayar, and, uh, and, and Anna. Um, there's so many people to thank, but I would just like to uh, ask you to, to, to uh, uh, join me in a round of applause to, to thank these people. <laughs> On some of the screens, you see kind of an, an, an invitation to respect everyone who's around. I mean, you know, as a, as a community of uh, economists, we're... we're facing some challenges that, uh, in, in, in recent years, also in uh, recent weeks, if uh, uh, you've, you've been following the, the, you know, let me call it the, the news or what's been, been going on. Um, we have the codes of conduct of both societies on, on, on the websites. I, I invite you to read them and also to kind of think about uh, uh, those codes of conduct when, whenever we, we intervene and whenever we, we interact with everyone. Um, um, this is all about the research, and I think part of the research is what we're going to be talking about right now is, is uh, uh, something that I think is research that's ex extremely relevant for what is happening in the world right now. It's affecting uh, the lives of so many people, the war in Ukraine. Um, so I would like to introduce this, this panel. We have uh, three uh, amazing speakers on this. Let me start with uh, Timo, Timofey Milovanov, who is the former uh, minister of the Ukraine government. He was the minister of uh, economic development, trade and ag agriculture. Um, he's now the president and a professor at the uh, Kiev School of uh, Economics. He has a PhD from the University of Wisconsin, was faculty at Penn State, UPenn and uh, uh, University of Pittsburgh. His work is on mechanism design. If you follow him on Twitter, he's extremely uh, insightful on, on many issues uh, on Twitter. You see that he really thinks carefully about designing institutions, designing mechanisms for uh, the Ukraine in, in particular. We have um, uh, Oleg Itzkoki. Uh, he's a professor of economics at UCLA. He was formerly at Princeton. His PhD is from Harvard. He works on international macro, international finance. Uh, he's the 2022 recipient of the John Bates Clark Medal uh, for his fundamental contributions to both international finance and international trade. And then we have uh, Konstantin uh, Sonin, who's a professor at the University of Chicago. Um, he's been the vice rector of both the New School of Economics and the Higher School of Economics uh, in Moscow. He has a PhD in mathematics from the Moscow State University, and his work is on political economy with a special focus on, on Russia, but uh, also more uh, broadly. I would like to apologize for one fact, and it, it, uh, it hurts me. It's that it's an all-male panel. We tried. Uh, there's good reasons. Some people uh, could not be here today for very justifiable reasons, but it was not meant to be an all-male panel. So my apologies uh, for that. Um, let me start by just asking before we really delve into the data and the facts. Um, can you just, each of you, briefly indicate whether 
you know, how this war has changed people's lives. Because ultimately we talk about economics and we talk about facts and statistics. But to one extent, I mean, I see uh, Timothy told me yesterday he, there's no flights taking off from anywhere in Ukraine. I mean, no passenger flights, not, not, uh, there's, there's military flights. But, um, so he drove 15 hours to get to an airport in, in, in Moscow. But in, if you can, in one or two sentences, how does the war affect people uh, directly? Yeah, I, uh, difficult question. I think uh, some. I think Joel asked me uh, if uh, if I if we live in fear. I, I, I think humans get used to it unless you're in the front lines. Um, it's really annoying the sirens and attacks, missile attacks. You know, happening every night. Uh, people die, of course. Uh, some uh, around, and you can, but you somehow don't think about it. You just simply are exhausted. What what takes a toll? is uh, people who die who you know. For example, at the Kiev School of Economics, we have a entrepreneurship program for veterans from 2014, 2016. 70% of them went back to the military uh, on the during the first two days. And at this point, 10% of the alumni of that program are killed. So that takes a toll where every day you you learn that someone has died, and you ask yourself a question, why is it happening in the name of what uh, Russia has uh, invaded Ukraine. So, um, and 80%, 78% of Ukrainians have uh, either a member of the family or a close friend who has been killed. So uh, it's a major drama, trauma for Ukrainians. I think that's the, the real cost. Uh, the rest you can adjust to, like, you know, economy, money, hardship, security. You get, that's all is adjustable, but people is not. And, and, and in Russia? OK, uh, first of all, I wanted to, uh, to thank the European Economic Association, the Economic Society, for organizing this meeting and all of you who came here um, for this meeting because like the least uh, thing that we can do is to pay attention to what is going on because the war, uh, the political repressions in Russia, they are going to go um, perhaps for a long time and people are naturally tired and mov moving on, but we need uh, to pay attention. So I thank you and call everyone to support the Kiev School of Economics. You could support in Kiev School of Economics, you could designate that like your money would go to a building a bomb shelter, something that is entirely uh, non-military, uh, bomb shelter for school kids, or uh, you could make an um, unspecified donation and this will go to defenders, uh, defenders of Ukraine. Uh, I, I think in, in, in Russia, like we, uh, the war happens in a totally different social strata. So when I uh, went to Kiev and in March and met people, basically everyone uh, had their relative, uh, everyone to whom I speak, they had relatives or friends who were killed. They go all on funerals. In Russia, I know zero people uh, in a wide, like in my wide social. Uh, network people who participated in the war, who went there, who were killed, zero. It's just going into in a totally different social strata. But of course, uh, a lot of my um, my friends, my peers, they are uh, victims of the repression. So they just anti-war. A lot of people left uh, left Russia. Uh, fearing repressions. A lot of people left Russia after the war started because they just do not want to, associated, to be associated with this. So I was surprised that many professors from the High School of Economics, they left uh, professors in humanities. They were not exposed directly, but they, they were not they old enough not to serve, but they did not want to be associated with this. So they left. Now they become, um, I don't know, we, Call them relicants, not to use the word refugees, all across Europe. Thank you. Yeah, no, so <clears throat> I'm much less connected uh, than Kosti is because I just didn't spend nearly as much time in Russia in the last uh, at least 10 years. But um, I mean, I, two points that I was going to make. Um, things have been going downhill for quite a while in Russia. I mean, and if you want to pick one economic number, that there was a lack of GDP growth for 
the past uh, 12, 14 years. So the war is not just a coincidence of uh, non-economic things. It's, it's actually, I think, directly rooted in the lack of economic performance and uh, the repressions that have been, been tightening in Russia before the beginning of the invasion in 22, they were kind of another sign of things going downhill for a long period of time. And so, uh, I mean, if, if you don't quite take it out of perspective, I mean, the, the trends were not good before. Nobody could imagine it would turn out in a full-scale uh, war of this magnitude, but, uh, you know, the trends were there. Uh, in a way, and repression trends were there uh, in a way. And so the second thing I was going to say, I personally was not particularly affected directly, but uh, so I, I live in California, and so we're part of the, um, uh, like a tech community of Russian-speaking people in California, and so it just happens to be that Snapchat is incorporated in LA where I live, and half of the Snap team is Ukrainian and half of the team is Russian, and so Russian was kind of the language that was spoken. And we had these two parallel chats right at the beginning of the war. And so people from Ukraine were uh, discussing how they should get their relatives out of the country, out of the bombing. And then people from Russia were discussing uh, how to get money out of the banks in Russia, right? And so we had to kind of watch those two parallel texts. I was kind of not affected directly by any of it, but it, it just, so this is the, uh, the, the contrast that, you know, we've been observing basically. Let's start and talk now about the, uh, the, the facts, maybe. Uh, this is a, a panel on, on, on the macroeconomic consequences. So uh, we, we'll have two sets of slides. Timothy is going to talk about some facts on the Ukrainian economy, and Oleg is going to talk about some facts on uh, uh, the Russian economy. So I suggest we start now uh, with the, the, the slides on the Ukraine. Uh, can, can we have the slides, please? Thanks. So, yeah, thank you. So I'm going to talk a little, mostly about Ukrainian economy. So GDP, uh, the second quarter, the quarter when the war started, dropped down by 37 uh, percent. But the government actually responded quite well. And there's, if there is one lesson for economy, it's substitution works um, and innovation works. And uh, external threat uh, re resolves uh, or removes all kinds of uh, conflict of interests and uh, creates better motivation and trust and commitment. And so the economy has adjusted and brought back, uh, the, dropped to 29% at the end of 2022 and is expected to grow by 3-5% this year. Inflation was 10% prior to invasion, 26% in 2022. And it, uh, the central bank has been able to bring it back to 11 as of July, expecting 10% uh, in August numbers. Migration, there are different estimates uh, from two to eight million. The most recent estimate is at five, six million, four uh, plus million moved to the West. That means one, two million moved to Russia. Net migration is expected at zero uh, this year with gradual uh, restoration and people coming back over the next uh, five years. Labor force projected to shrink from 17 to 14, 15 million people unless there is a serious rebuilding effort. If there is a rebuilding effort post-war, the labor force will come back to the same numbers. Um, that currently is at 80% of GDP and growing. We expect it to be 120 quite soon. International support, $32 billion in 2022. That's 26% of, uh, uh, of expenditures. And to put in perspective, the GDP was $200 billion before the war. So. 40 plus billion in 2023, that's non-military support. That's just macroeconomic support for budget for social purposes. Um, defense support is separate. It's uh, tens of billions of dollars elsewhere. Monetization of the budget deficit in 2022, the lesson from this war is the economy can adjust, but uh, um, commitment of uh, external support is important, but also important uh, that it's delivered smoothly. In the beginning of the war in 2022, the Western support was not smooth. There were a lot of commitments, but uh, they were delayed, or sometimes they came in bulk. And so the liquidity crunch was there. Ukraine had to monetize the budget deficit by about $10 billion, and uh, that caused devaluation at 30% uh, at the exchange rate. Since that, that has been stabilized, and national reserves of the central bank um, are at all-time highs, historical high. Um, structural reforms continue. Surprisingly, during the war, so for like it's the, the answer to the question is it uh, more difficult or less difficult to do structural reforms? Let's say remove oligarchs or move vested interest out of the politics and economy during the war. Yeah, actually, it is easier 
it's being done. There is a Ukraine facility program uh, by the EU, which uh, combines all kinds of support for the next four years. So what the EU is trying to do is trying to overcome political cycle issues and commit to the medium to the long term support of until 2027 with a major program and provide 50% of the expected 120, 130 billion support needed, uh, hoping that the rest, uh, that the U US will follow the lead. Um, the IMF program, just one word, uh, what's interesting about the IMF program is that the IMF, uh, as recently as a year ago, believed it's impossible to support Ukraine during the war because it doesn't support wartime countries. Uh, it did, things can happen, can change, uh, they changed the internal regulations and by December last year there was a program in place. Uh, damages are to capital mostly at $150, that the billion dollars. That's direct. That's that's comparable with an annual uh, GDP, GDP at 200 billion prior. 50%. Uh, uh, excuse me, $250 billion. That's additional losses. That's what businesses have lost. Opportunity cost. The largest damages are to residential housing. 7% of houses have been damaged or destroyed. So imagine every 13 house in your country is gone. So that's the amount of damage which is difficult to um, comprehend. I will probably, I'll skip the agriculture because this grain deal happening and how we are now bypassing and moving everything through Danube. But uh, just one number to keep current expert is at 4 million tons a year, uh, a month per, um, we need about 5 million to stay, to be able to export everything. And we, uh, the, the harvest uh, this year is actually going to be a little bit larger. The agriculture is, uh, industry is adapting, and, and despite the Russia um, pulling out from the grain deal and attacking the port infrastructure, um, Ukrainian agriculture is growing. Um, Russia has destroyed about 35% of infrastructure in the Nub River, uh, fully destroyed uh, south ports in Odessa, uh, almost fully. Uh, but we're putting area defense there, and area defense, the geography and area defense becomes an important part of the economy and the way you do investments now. But uh, I'm happy to talk about it uh, more. I will, uh, I will give room to Oleg and Kostya on Russian economy. Uh, Kiev School of Economics runs the tracker of Russian economy using intelligence data. So I cannot publish those papers, but this is available uh, on the website of the uh, Kiev School of Economics Institute, KC Institute, Russia chart book, monthly we give out. I think I will give you, mm, I'll make the slides available, something later. But um, uh, he, I think uh, I encourage you to look at the KC Institute, Russia chart book, uh, July edition. Uh, sanctions are working, but Russia economy is far from inflection point, and I want to show you these two charts. This is the change in the trade in oil, where they are shipping oil. So the overall volumes of oil have not decreased that much, actually, due to sanctions, but there is a major substitution now goes to India and China. Uh, now, how are they doing it? 62% um, of oil still uh, is being done using shipping uh, companies which are subject to the Western jurisdiction and so the sanctions and price cap there matters, but the rest is being done through the shadow fleet. Shadow fleet is estimated 131 tanker. Two thirds of these tankers are old. Uh, they use Danish Straits and other European waters. They are not insured and I think we expect an ecological disaster there eventually. Uh, now, uh, the volumes are not down, but the revenues are down. So if you look at the oil export earnings because of price cap and still 62% of trade is subject to the Western sanctions, this is actually happening. Uh, I, I'm gonna stop here. I just want to say also that um, uh, Russian Shahed's, Iranian Russian Shahed's, and Orlan tanks, surveillance recon reconnaissance drones. They are using over 140 elements, uh, which are mostly produced. 69% of them are produced in the, by the U.S. companies. Um, and so today, U.S. equipment, uh, processors, uh, electronics is being used uh, to kill Ukrainians and the companies like Intel, IBM and others could impose a much stricter uh, control and verification of uh, what their distributors do uh, so they save lives. That's, a, that's, I think, inappropriate to put it diplomatically. Um, and the trade is happening through China, through Hong Kong, through Turkey and 
Emirates. Thank you. So, so it seems that measurement is is particularly hard, not just the measurement, and I would like to ask Constantin to, to uh, weigh on it, but also I guess we have to face again how difficult it is uh, you know, to have a measure of GDP, because if, if countries now start to consume completely different things, you know, is that comparable? I mean, before there was no demand, I guess, for uh, you know, bulletproof jackets, and now there is. So I guess the, 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 even the basket when you calculate inflation must now look different. Is, is that an issue that you, know, you, you think about? Yeah, so numbers like GDP is, is a strange number to even look at because it assumes some con continuity of preferences. You're measuring it against some benchmark. That benchmark makes no sense. No one is interested in spa services in Ukraine at this point. And my personal consumption basically is down to zero because we're cooking at home and uh, you know, we're donating money. Donating money to a cause now would be considered to be a loss because it's then wasted sort of in, in the books, but in practice that saves lives. And you have an IT guy who used to provide outsourced services valued 50K to a Boston consulting, let's say, from Kiev. But now he is operating a drone platform which saves uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of lives. And that's not measurable, non monetizable. So there are two issues uh, a structural change in preferences and, uh, and a lot of uh, production which goes towards defense is not monetized, or refugees, or support, or you know, volunteering work, charity work, all of this. There's, sim there's simply no market, there's no number in it. So I think those GDP, in fact, might have grown if you kind of had a model of this. Uh, but yeah, you're correct, so GDP. Oh, other things which are objective, like the number of tankers, or you know, macroeconomic financial support from the EU, that's measurable. But uh, yeah, but the GDP. <laughs> I don't know what it means really now in the war. Konstantin, can you weigh in on the data collection in, in Russia? In the meantime, can I ask the other slides uh, for uh, Oleg's presentation? Yeah, be before uh, Alex speaks about the Russian economy using the Russian data, I, w I wanted to say a couple of words about data limitations. Uh, back 50 years ago in the United States, there was a big discussion about the Soviet Union, where the Soviet Union cooks uh, cook statistical books where there is a double reporting. So there is an internal reporting for the planning purposes and the external reporting for public consumption. And the, uh, the United States economists, they try to uh, run large pro uh, projects to uh, so, sort of double measure the Soviet, Soviet data. And the conclusion of this debate was that double, uh, double bookkeeping is, is impossible. So basically, and this was proved true when the Soviet Union collapsed, so it became known that there were no double bookkeeping, that the Soviet government just published less and less data and eventually started to collect less data. And that's basically what the Russian government have been doing since the start of the war. They are both collecting less data and uh, reporting less data. Also, I need to note that this is not what happens in the Soviet times. The Russian statistical agency, since the start of the war, there were several episodes in which they would report, uh, report some numbers, then uh, Putin would say something publicly about these numbers, and the numbers are revised in a week or two. And uh, of course, they're always, rewarded, uh, the, they're always revised in a way that Putin was right and the initial estimate was wrong. Especially this year, it was most not noticeable when they reported a rise in real incomes. They first reported a loss in real incomes over the last two years. Then uh, Putin said that the real income rose and they published revised estimates. This does not square with the data, for example, on retail sales, which have fallen and basically every consumption product that also uh, fall over this year. So I think that generally macroeconomic data is still um, is still reported the way it is collected. Uh, I think that the Ukrainian intelligence, I mean, we generally have very high respect to Ukrainian intelligence based on military outcomes, but I think basically the intelligence about the Russian economic data is that they just buy uh, the secret Russian data. So there is no secret Russian data because it's just being, uh, just being sold to Ukrainian intelligence and then estimated by KSC. 
but I think the problem with the quality of data that they just stop collecting something, it's still there. Oleg, would you uh, comment on the Russian uh, data? Yes, yeah, so, well, uh, I was going to go to the slide. So my specialty is international stuff, so it's stuff related to international trade capital flows. And so this is the data that's actually, oh, perfect. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the data that's actually available daily, right? So like, the, this is the graph of the Russian exchange rate, which essentially tells the, uh, it's ruble against the dollar, which tells the, um, ooh, I have it here, okay. Uh, it tells the story of the war and sanctions and basically one chart, and that's the variable that's kind of available at like uh, second intervals, right? You can, you can see it. And when you don't have reliable data on GDP on inflation, actually, you know, like the GDP growth this year would be around zero, but it's kind of not a very meaningful number because it hides a lot of the heterogeneity that you alluded to, that there is a huge increase in the military-related parts of GDP and pretty significant decline in the non-military part. And if you talk about one number, it's not a particularly useful number, and it happens to be close to zero this year. But So what happens with the exchange rate? So you see, so basically this was the beginning of the war and a massive devaluation, and this is this unrealized, I mean, there was a, you know, there was a financial run, there was a run on the banks, there was a currency crisis, which lasted about a week or two weeks, right? And then things stabilized. Um, and so it sort of suggests both that the initial financial sanctions were quite capable in like triggering something like a run-like episode, but the sanctions that followed uh, were not sufficient to sort of trigger a full-scale financial crisis and things stabilized. And so uh, Timothy actually hinted quite a lot uh, at it already. So he had a bullet point saying uh, sanctions work if you have to do like a zero-one kind of thing but they're you know, far from being enough to stop the war by triggering something like a financial crisis if this was sort of the, the, the goal of the sanctions. And so uh, the reason is that financial sanctions that were imposed in the beginning, they were you know, very impressive. It was a freezing of about 300 billion of do dollars of uh, reserves of the central bank. And the central bank got um, uh, on, their, on the uh, uh, list of sanctioned entities. So he, actually the central bank couldn't do open market operations with currencies anymore. So this was kind of quite impressive, but then something happened here and ruble appreciated quite a lot, right? And so it was very strong all of 22. And so there were kind of these two types of comments that people were saying. They were like, well, this is no longer a market-based currency. It's all kind of uh, driven by capital controls. And so it's not reflect fundamentals. The other one was like, sanctions are not working. What happens with ruble? It just turns out none of this is actually a correct way of thinking about it. The ruble is actually a very much a market-based variable, which reflects what happens um, uh, to the economy. And so let me show you. So this is something that Timofey uh, mentioned. But basically, in parallel with um, massive financial sanctions, what happened was that these were exports. And so exports increased dramatically with oil prices going up and then they kind of stayed throughout uh, 22, and imports went down, right? And so if you kind of think what's a typical crisis, a typical crisis is when people actually squeezed on the income side, so they have less money to buy stuff and they have to go through kind of austerity, like Europe went in 2010, 2012, 2013. Uh, Russian crisis was completely opposite of it, right? Like a lot of goods became unavailable, but actually there was abundance of currency and income, right? And so this is reflected in this massive uh, trade surpluses. So these blue bars, which is about $30 billion a month, these were trade surpluses in 22, right? And so on one hand, you kind of like freeze 300 billion of reserves, and on the other hand, Russia is running $30 billion of trade surpluses monthly, right? And so those were the things that completely dominated uh, 22. So 23 looks sort of different, and so you kind of, um, well, I had this picture. So you see, uh, sort of starting last summer, Ruble started depreciating again, and so this was the reflection that actually, well, if you ask, like, are sanctions working or not? Well, yes, they work. They appreciated the exchange rate because imports were squeezed, right? So the sanctions were focused on imports. They, uh, they squeezed imports. They kind of led to the increase in the cost of living. But if the goal was the financial crisis and not the increase of cost of living, right, they actually did exactly the opposite. They uh, relieved the need to do austerity 
for, for people. They, they just couldn't, you know, it's, it's a bit like a situation during a pandemic. You have the income, but you, don't, you cannot buy certain services, right? There was the similar situation. People had the income in 22, but they didn't have the ability to buy certain important, imported goods. And this is actually the opposite of the financial crisis. It kind of prevents the financial crisis because it, 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 it uh, uh, creates an abundance of currency and financial resources in the system, right? And so we, we have a paper where we kind of show that, you know, combining financial sanctions with import sanctions is sort of like not the best idea, right? They, they happen to just offset each other, if, if the goal is a quick um, financial crisis. Um, oh yeah, so one interesting thing here, so I mean, a lot of people were paying attention to, so the, the, the red line is what basically the model says purely based on what happens to trade, to exports and imports, and it was actually predicting things pretty well for, until the summer, right? And so what happened in the summer, so this was the Prigozhin mutiny happened around here, and this is this extra capital outflows that seem to kind of be actually driving the current uh, uh, ruble depreciation, right? And so until, so what Timothy was saying is like the breaking point of the economy that doesn't look like sanctions are bringing it close, but s some events like uh, the political turbulence or like a Prigozhin mutiny, they, they trigger something that again looks akin to a sort of like a financial crisis or a currency crisis episode. And so, okay, and so the last thing I was gonna say, I mean, this is a bit of a provocative slide. It's like who actually paid for the war in 2022? So you, and so Timothy hinted at it as well, but you sort of see that, you know, China and India were buying this, ex, this is the extra purchases of essentially Russian oil. And Russian crude oil accounts for like 25% of exports and the uh, oil products is another 20 and then gas is another 20, right? So, and you know, it, it, it goes towards like 65% just oil and between oil and gas, right? And you can sort of see that, you know, basically China, so India is all about buying more quantities. And so what Timothy, so this is a five, billion, uh, five million dollars barrel, five million, uh, five million barrels a day of exports of oil, it stayed very, very flat over time, right? But you see that Europe was coming down, but it just Europe came down kind of slowly. It's sort of amazing that it happened within a year, but it had to last for about eight months of war until, uh, until Europe came down. And China and India became the main customers, and China is actually paying market prices for Russian oil, unlike unlike India, right? And so Europe cut down on quantities but paid very high prices. And so the very last thing I'm gonna show you is what happens with actually the price that Russia gets for oil. So, so, so it seems where sanctions did sort of work in 22. They shaved off, so the, the, the gray line would be the world prices, which kind of skyrocketed in 22, right? They went to 120. Russia was receiving massive discounts during the 22. Right, and so the sanctions probably kind of led to that, that these were market-based discounts before the cap and the embargo. And the cap and embargo kind of started here, but you can sort of see that as world oil prices sort of came down a bit from the, from the record highs to like 80, 85 now, the discounts actually closed. And so sanctions are shaving off just like, a t I mean, 10% of revenues, maybe 15% of revenues, but it's not creating a, a uh, situation that's like just qualitatively different for the economy. Given $85 a barrel oil prices in the world, it's just far from uh, the breaking point for the Russian economy. And because of that, economically in principle, based on fundamentals, things can last for many, many months, if not multiple years, right? And so in that sense, sort of sanctions are working, but they're far from being enough, and you can sort of not rely just on sanctions. Maybe you can move into some of the kind of more particular sectors that was talk about agriculture, manufacturing, and, and, and energy. Now that we're talking about the uh, oil, Constantine, is is your reading that what people were expecting to happen to energy markets globally, that this has been actually much less uh, of a big deal than people thought it would be? And I'm also referring indirectly to the, some of you have followed the, the, the German economist who, who went into a kind of a, a serious discussion with the policymakers in Germany, including the, the, the chancellor, uh, arguing that, you know, their models predicted exactly what more or less has happened and that people initially were having very uh, pessimistic uh, uh, kind of predictions. Is that your own reading? Uh, yes, yes I, I think that European econ economists uh, they actually scored a, a big point because when the war started, there were immediately discussions about how uh, G Germany and other European countries could get rid of the Russian gas. And the assumption, the general public assumption, was that this is a difficult process. And the economists, I, I remember Dan Mulby being on one of the co authors of these papers, but there were several papers uh, saying that actually the impact will not be that, that huge, that this is, this is totally possible. 
And basically, in a year, we saw that it was totally possible, and the German economy uh, perhaps is growing not that fast that many people would hope for, but it's still it's still growing, and there was no nothing near a devastating effect that uh, public assumed that will be there. But is it kind of a two-edged uh, sword in a sense that, you know, what seems resilient in terms of economies to adjusting to new supply uh, patterns and, and, and changing prices, that they adjust very well, but that, that also means that sanctions don't work in the same way because, you know, sanctions are also bypassing or behavior is bypassing the sanctions. Okay, the thing is, uh, uh, the importance, uh, like, of this gas experiment is that with gas, there is little doubt that the... German dependence on Russian gas, at least pipeline gas, was really cut off. It's not like that we are not knowing where tanker is going and under which flag. The pipelines are just, have just stopped and there never been uh, the NLG capacity to fill this, uh, to fill this gap immediately. So it, we, we know that Germany stopped to, um, to use Russian Russian gas. I think that there is a political economy part to that. I think that the perception of how much Germany depends on Russian gas was sort of overhyped before the uh, before the war. So it was politicians wanted to have good relations with Russia. There was some idea behind this strategy, and they sort of pushed a bit too far uh, the German, Germans' dependence on Russian, Russian gas. Okay, thanks. So, uh, Timothy, you, 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 sure, go ahead. Oh. So I was just going to briefly add to this that two things that are most remarkable, I think, about 2022 is how fast Russia could switch selling those five million uh, barrels a day of oil from Europe to India and China. This happened over, over less than eight months. It's kind of completely remarkable how fast that switch happened. But this is easier to understand because it's basically rerouting the, rerouting the tarn cares. But that did happen over a period of eight months. The second thing was how, how little of a shock for the European economy was the uh, waning out of using any kind of uh, Russian energy resources. So these were the two big surprises. The elasticities of substitution are way higher than economy, even economists assumed. And then the public assumes that elasticity of substitution is zero, right? And so elasticity of substitution is very, very high when you have a powerful price signal. And so the other thing, are sanctions working or not? At $85 a barrel for oil, you know, sanctions cannot work, right? Like given that high oil price, there would be always a demand for oil that you sell at some of a discount, right? And so the only way to really um, kind of inflict serious damage is bring world oil prices down, right? And uh, so sanctions are just very difficult given how high the oil price is right now. But, but I guess that was a strategy that Putin understood that a war would drive up prices. Uh, oh, absolutely, and this is crazy. Like, if you think about China, and this is a point that uh, Farid Zakaria is doing, any conflict that China triggers would be, have a negative feedback on China through the economy. Any conflict that Russia started has a positive feedback through high oil prices. And this is the crazy situation is that it c creates economic incentives to actually start conflicts because they have a positive feedback loop into the economy. So energy is one aspect. You mentioned agriculture. We also talked a little bit yesterday about uh, uh, manufacturing. Timothy, what's the situation now after a year and a half in the war? So agriculture, uh, Ukraine lost 20% of land and the harvest went, before the war it was at 106, 108 million tons with 65 million tons exported on the global markets. So the, now the um, harvest went down to 75 in 2022 and expected to be 77 in, uh, in 2023. Actually, it's growing despite the Russian pullout from the Green Deal. Um, we export currently about four, without Green Deal, we export currently about 4 million tons a month and our stock that we want, like the, the total stock, was at the, in July 2022 was at 20 million, and in July 2023 it was at 7 million. So we're actually doing quite well. Um, if we don't do anything, we still can export 4 million tons a, a month, that's about 50 a year. Not quite 65, that was, you know, pre war. 
but still sizable. 70% um, of this export is done through river ports on Danube, from which barges go to constant to Romanian seaport. And what Russia military is doing now is attacking this route. And, you know, it's sometimes it's a, the attacks are happening within hundreds of meters from the border with Romania. Um, about 35% of infrastructure has been destroyed over uh, the summer uh, of this river port. But uh, Ukraine and the allies are putting um, air defense. And over the last weeks, the attacks have b become much more difficult. So Russia is using drones mostly, not missiles. Missiles is a bit too dangerous, uh, close to NATO uh, country, but using drones uh, from Crimea. And it points out towards a broader Crimea implications globally. And I think people underestimate the importance of Crimea. As long as Russia is going to control Crimea, the Black Sea security, not just in Odessa, but elsewhere, will be jeopardized. Um, and I think um, countries on the um, western side of the, of the Black Sea are now being seriously affected by ecological damage, by mines, which just float in the sea, and all kinds of issues. So Black Sea security is, is, is becoming increasingly an issue. There's been uh, this uh, propaganda effort, which is, uh, so has been successful by Russia, actually, that they recently boarded a Turkish ship. They did not border it. Uh, border, uh, they didn't board it. The actually ship was threatened, and it just moved uh, closer to the territorial waters of the NATO countries, and they didn't border it. But uh, the Minister of Defense of Russia um, uh, released uh, fake old footage of a helicopter uh, boarding a ship. And that was amplified by Twitter, in particular, and by social networks more generally. And now even uh, reputable think tanks uh, in the US are issuing reports that uh, Russia has taken hostile action. So they're trying to suppress trade. Uh, in the region, because uh, that ship was going to a Romanian port, not to a Ukrainian port. And the fact that they have been successfully able to penetrate the narrative and uh, dominate the narrative that they have been able to harass that ship is also a part of the effort trying to basically make it impossible to trade in, in Black Sea. So agenda is bigger than just Ukrainian ports. Uh, the agenda is to su subdue or make impossible to tra trade in all Western Black Sea. Um, and that basically makes uh, any kind of resolution down the road much more difficult because geographically, um, geographically Crimea is very vulnerable to counterattacks and then the Western Black Seas. So, you know, and we're talking about 65 million tons from Ukraine and uh, all kinds of uh, trade uh, in food security uh, through Turkey, through Bosphorus. Um, so the, the, the global south kind of food security and food security issue will continue to uh, dominate the political agenda for the next several years until this war is resolved in, way, in one way or another. So I think what Russia is trying to do is uh, it has uh, tried to weaponize energy prior to the war. And now it has, it has been quite successful at weaponizing uh, food security uh, and agricultural products more generally, uh, using it as a tool to destabilize or put pressure on global south. Um, yeah, I don't know, like Ukraine will manage Will the food security situation, will the global south manage that? I'm not so sure. Okay. Is, is, is there danger of famine at some point? I mean, Amartya Sen used to say that, you know, famine, at least for the last maybe 100 years, is not an issue of technology, it's an issue of wars. Yes. So there are two points. One is Ukraine provided food security for about 400 million people before the war. And Ukraine has not always been a, great, a big player, but around 2012, 2008, Ukraine was not a global player. So Ukraine grows in productivity of agriculture. It's a recent phenomenon over the last 10 years. And Russia has started to harass through trade um, 
adversarial actions uh, the Ukrainian agricultural markets as early as 2012, way b several years before Crimea annexation. So food uh, security and food competition between Russia and Ukraine has been an issue from the moment Ukraine agricultural productivity has started increasing. Um, Ukraine keeps the pricing competitive in the region. And when in the East, in the Middle East, when there are issues, let's say, between Emirates and Saudis and Qatar and others, there are uh, blockades. It doesn't always get into the news uh, in the West, uh, but there are internal uh, fights over uh, food security. Um, Ukraine has been actually a reliable partner, and it delivered before the war food throughout the blockades. So Ukraine is an important player for food security. I've been, when I was in the government, at the meetings with all kinds of sheikhs, uh, powerful people. They are really concerned about, they, they care about two things, defense security and food security from Ukraine in the region. So Russia taking out Ukraine will increase their bargaining power. Now famine, I think uh, what happens when the supply is down, basically the developed countries are able to buy out. Yeah, it's like uh, so the people who are in the poorest countries are suffering the most. So in that sense, it will have implications, and it does have implications already for poverty in, in some areas, but no one cares because we don't, uh, in the developed world, it's just a tiny, you know, inflation in the food prices is, is not substantive. We basically buy out from the, from the developing countries the, the food supply. So these two points, yeah. Russia was kept in check by Ukrainian uh, competition. That's becoming more of an issue. And I think uh, countries will suffer, especially in Africa. Food security and, and, and poverty towards inequality. I, I thought we talked earlier about kind of an, an, an image that uh, uh, in Russia, people were surprised to see basically when they saw images of the war in, in, in Ukraine that, that the countryside in the Ukraine wasn't actually, didn't look that poor. And Russia has a lot of inequality. I mean, Moscow and St. Petersburg are very different from the rural areas. What has the war done in terms of inequality in, in Russia? Uh, thanks, but could I make, make a point uh, which is co comment both to what Alex said and what uh, Timothy said, Alex said, like, that uh, crisis benefits Russia. Timothy was saying that Russia was successful. This is successful and helped Russia only conditional on that Russia somehow bound to wage a war of conquest against Ukraine or conquer Ukraine or destroy it. Otherwise, everything that Russia does, weaponizing energy, weaponizing food supply, uh, bombing Ukraine, hurts Russia. It did not bring any material benefits to Russia. It's, it caused the largest refugee crisis in Russia in uh, 100 years. So Russia is massively worse off. It's already because of the annexation of Crimea and invasion of Donbass in 2014. It was already like 10% of wealth lost because of the lost uh, growth, uh, growth years. Now, perhaps the consumption level of Russian people would be back to the to 2021 year, maybe in 2030, and maybe I don't know, maybe never in my in my lifetime. So this is this is this was a war of choice. This keeps being a war of choice, and the best economic strategy for Russia, with respect to grain, with respect to oil and gas exports, with respect to uh, growth prospects is to withdraw immediately, compensate Ukraine for the uh, for the damage, and try to restore uh, the international international relations. So, like when we say Russia is successful, it's successful conditional that it's somehow bound, not chosen, but bound to keep uh, keep the war going. Yep. So I fully agree with Kostya. It's, uh, it's the war is devastated for pretty much every single Russian abroad or in Russia, apart from a tiny group of people that might be benefiting from it. Uh, not everybody in Russia realizes that the war is devastating for them quite yet, but I think that's very clear, and I fully uh, think similarly to the way Kostya thinks about it. What I meant to say is, if you think of the government, combined with the financial sector, combined with some industrial companies and extra companies as like one sector of the Russian economy, 
uh, the war relaxed its budget constraint by high oil prices, right? So, so what really happened is that the, the budget constraint was relaxed. And as an economist, we typically think of the limits to what you can do is you cannot escape your budget constraint. Budget constraint is like you can, ha you can make different crazy choices, but they have to be within the budget constraint, right? And so the goal of sanctions is to tighten that budget constraint as much as possible to make fewer things feasible, right? And so the war triggered high oil prices in the world, which actually relaxed the budget constraint. And that's the crazy pervo perverse feedback loop that actually, you know, probably the Western countries should make sure does not happen by kind of, you know, throwing a lot of oil and like nuclear energy on the world market in the times of the crisis like that, which was probably the biggest policy mistake in Europe and in the U.S. I'll come back to, to Jan's question. I just wanted to uh, say uh, to, to, to Timothy and others that when we talk about the Russia, Russia losses and Russia, or because of the war, of course, we are not trying to like um, switch the victimhood. Of course, Ukraine's losses are far larger. They are, they were unprovoked. They, they are victims. But I'm just saying that when we say that Russia was successful in bombing something, it doesn't, it's successful conditional uh, that on something which should not have happened and which was a strategy of, I mean, you're an international economist, I'm a game theorist. So this is, this is a strategy to wage the war. It's not a exogenous parameter. Um, on on the inequality on the inequality issue, that was one, one thing that was visible in the reports of Russian troops uh, going into the southern Ukraine. And these are uh, these parts of Ukraine. Uh, these are rural parts. They are not. Uh, the rich part, uh, even among the rural parts, this is not the rich part, and there were a lot of reports that Russian troops, uh, people who come predominantly from uh, poor regions, they are surprised how good infrastructure is, how rich uh, the households are, that basically all the homes have the, uh, the things like washing machines that Russian provincial cities would not, uh, would not have. And this is sort of strange because Russia's GDP per capita, the official data, I mean, before the war, not the inflated data, it's uh, three times more than Ukrainian GDP per capita. So it was like an army of a rich country invading a poor country, and then the soldiers see that actually this country is far richer. And it seems that uh, Russia's GDP per capita is very much tilted toward the large, uh, large cities, which are 10, 15 percent of the population. So the median uh, household income in Russia perhaps is much closer to the median income in, in Ukraine and uh, well be behind the countries, uh, countries of Eastern, Eastern Europe. Okay, I would like to leave some time for questions. Let me just round up with the last kind of topic I would like to uh, uh, talk about here is that, you know, in terms of looking forward, in terms of mechanism design, institutional design, market design, is there something obvious that should happen maybe in Russia, maybe in uh, Ukraine, maybe more broadly, maybe at the, you know, in terms of financial markets, is there things that can be done where, you know, the economist's approach can, uh, uh, can improve lives? It's a great question. I mean, uh, I agree fully with Kostya. What happened should have been completely outside of equilibrium path. It, it should have been so costly to do what Russia did that, it, like, this is the good design of institutions to make the sections so costly that they just cannot ever happen in equilibrium, right? And so the only way to kind of ensure that is uh, if you really, really do tighten the budget constraint after this happened. That's the only way you ensure it, right? And so it, it has to be a dramatic, dic on the economic grounds, right? Then there are, uh, uh, what has happened now is that there is a lot more focus on the military and less focus on the economic sanctions. Economic sanctions, we talked a lot in 2022, and people kind of forgot about economic sanctions recently, but I think it's a mistake, right? It has to be a combination of things that truly makes this enough equilibrium path action, even uh, for people with completely crazy beliefs, right? What I think on pragmatics of sanctions and help uh, what game theory teaches us that commitment is extremely important. So for Ukraine, it's not not only the direct transfers of weapons and transfers of uh, 
help, financial help and support is important, but it's very important to make it long term, perhaps longer term than a typical political cycle in Western countries. So the projection should be not only in words of like NATO generals and country leaders that uh, there will be support to Ukraine um, up until U Ukrainian uh, victory and liberation of the Ukrainian territory, but it should be like as, as institutionalized, this commitment should be as institutionalized as possible. In, in Ukraine, has it, I mean, there's of course, it, it's, it's horrible whatever the situation is, but has there been a kind of a silver lining in the sense that there's been an opportunity to build new institutions? I mean, there's a lot of talk about you know, getting rid of corruption and, and fighting hard to, to do that. Do you have a feeling that in, in Ukraine this is also an opportunity? So Ukraine has been building itself since 2014, since Crimean annexation and Maidan, and uh, and it's a country. We just talked yesterday that eight years ago, nine years, nine years ago, in 2014, our own secret police was shooting our protesters. Um, hundreds of them were killed. And eight years later, in 2022, we have the military which is able to resist and stop. Um, full-scale invasion by Russia. So Ukraine has been growing and changing at uh, unprecedented historical rates um, to, to be able to transform itself uh, within eight years from a country which was fully corrupt under Yanukovych, who then fled to Russia, to a country which uh, it's in teenage, but it's a proper democracy with a very robust debate. And uh, even today, uh, people who will travel to Ukraine would be surprised how much criticism Zelensky is getting domestically for all kinds of uh, presumably minor policy issues, really minor, uh, given the broader picture. So this uh, healthy criticism and distrust towards the government and political comp competition is there. Um, and um, the war removed a lot of infighting and focused the incentives of people on a bigger picture, on the kind of fundamental objectives. And I think that's important. There is another scandal going right now about increased pricing in military procurement. So it happens regularly. So much attention by the public to it. And, you know, the government, it probably will cost maybe this time the Ministry of Defense. Uh, his uh, office, even though he has been fantastic in uh, rallying support uh, internationally, and he is not corrupt, but uh, um, but I think uh, the pressure is there. So it's true that institutions are being built uh, even during the war, and this EU accession, EU candidacy creates a really, really uh, major gravity force for politicians and the public to change during the war. Now, the, the war is there, and um, it's, I think whoever expects it to be some kind of resolution tomorrow uh, is mistaken. And um, um, like there is this desire for negotiation. I, I think that's their fundamentals are not there for any kind of uh, negotiations, exactly because of commitment. You should, Putin has a very clear commitment towards one single goal uh, with respect to Ukraine, but maybe more broadly. Um, Zelensky also has made very clear, together with the West, their commitment. So, um, and then geographically and militarily, Crimea is very vulnerable and very important for the Black Sea region, for the entire region, and very vulnerable. And the war is now has moved uh, from, it's, it's kind of bimodal war. It's very brutal, almost like World War I in the trenches. Uh, and it's extremely high tech on the drone side. And the drone innovation in the drones and AI, it's, it's a new war with AI taking decisions over who, which targets to acquire and whom to execute, that was not yet present. So if someone you know, was, was thinking whether it's future or not, this future is now. Today, software uh, is making decisions uh, you know, based on video imaging, whom to attack. 
Um, and uh, it just, it's just, it's an innovation rate is unprecedented. So like every two months there is a major innovation in the drone warfare. Um, so, so I think the way it's gonna go, we're gonna see a relatively long war with both uh, party committed and politicians like the EU, for example, the Ukraine facility is actually trying uh, to create institutions to have longer term, medium term commitment, uh, which are longer than the political cycles. We'll see if the US is gonna respond to that. The rhetoric coming from the US, at least for the, due to the election, of course, is emboldening, uh, empowering Russia in some way. It's provoking uh, Russia. Um, so this is a little bit unfortunate, uh, but I think that will be overcome. Uh, and fundamentally, I think we're looking at a longer term war in which one of these sites at some point somewhere will, something will snap either in Ukraine or in Russia. It will happen within the next 10 years, I think, with probability one, uh, because Putin is aging. But uh, it might, we might have to wait, and a lot of people might have to die before that, unfortunately. Thank you, Timofey. We're running out of time, but we do have a, a time for a couple of questions. Is there, if anyone uh, would like to address a question to any of the panel members here in the front. Hi, Mishan Seke from the European Commission. Um, the discussion focused on the short-term adjustment to the war, and I think the surprising there, I think there is this very fast adjustment or substitution works. Now, I would like to see, get your view on the longer term. So will, in the longer term, you know, countries be able to kind of reshape their model. So Russia, do we see Russia as kind of out of Europe and not part of Europe any longer? And if so, what might be the implications for that, for the gross potential, particularly technological transfer and, you know, the, the embargo on the Western technology? And for the Ukraine, how do you see the situation, whether private sector is willing to invest in an country where you know basic security is might be questionable or how to guarantee that and how to put their public action to 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 and what sort of growth and what sort of uh, economic structure that would be probably more resilient to this type of situation thank you so just a very quick response to it and this is what i've been thinking quite a lot uh, in this context is one of the growth miracles that I think is least appreciated is the growth miracle that happened in Central European countries since 91, since 90, right? And so there is absolutely no reason to not think that the same type of trajectories are totally feasible for Ukraine and Belarus after the conflict is over, assuming you know, Belarus is liberated um, as well. Um, and so in that sense, you can have pretty actually favorable forecasts, just like extrapolating the trends from Central Europe to this region. And this is the gravitational pull of the European institutions, right? And it's very important for Southern Europe, and that's why EU, I think, is so uh, fundamental for Southern European countries, is the gravitational pull. It's not the euro or the common currency. And so the same thing happened in Central Europe, and it's a, a completely fascinating growth miracle. If you look at the least rich countries of the former Soviet bloc, they are converging on the same trajectories as the uh, you know, like always richer countries like the Czech Republic uh, in the past and so on. And so, but Russia is in a period of timelessness now, right? Like the spectrum of possibilities, uh, if you had to forecast 10, 20 years ahead, I mean, the uh, outcomes range from like a North Korean outcome to a full reset. And so basically making a forecast is pretty much impossible, I think, for Russia right now. Um, okay, for, for Ukraine, I'm even more optimistic than Oleg, because I think like in Uz Uzawa Lucas growth model, there, are, there will be so much capital stock destroyed, there is so much uh, investment opportunity, so after the war is over, it will be a, a growth miracle, and one of the most unappreciated growth miracles is the Italy after World War II. I mean, you do not need to be occupied by Americans <laughs> as Japan and Germany were to have a growth miracle, and you could change prime ministers every year and still <laughs> be a growth uh, uh, and still be a growth uh, miracle on, 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 on Russia. I think there is a wide variety of scenarios. I actually sort of um, switch to pessimistic view. So I imagine Russia sort of like Iran. Is Iran isolated from the world? You 
could actually travel, like everyone could travel there, <laughs> but it's, 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 it's not isolated of sorts, it's very much isolated and backwards in other respects, so I think future Russia is like Iranian future. So on Ukraine, I think, um, first of all, investment is happening even now. There is a very interesting phenomenon that, let's say, if we take American companies, those which have been present in Ukraine, they continue to invest. There is new electricity infrastructure. There is no new food processing. There is logistics. Uh, uh, if we look at the companies which have not been present in Ukraine, they are afraid to enter because of the war. So it's very, very heterogeneous. Um, com some companies grow, like Ukrainian Nova Post or others, you know, I've been asked not to, or like Orko, uh, they con like Kiev School of Economics has grown maybe 10 times in terms of revenues and contracts and students and everything. So uh, there is growth, it's very heterogeneous. It's very, the, you know, it's, it's like during a crisis, companies which are healthy and adjustable, adaptable, uh, they actually have tons of opportunities. Companies which are, you know, unhealthy, they are going out of market. Um, on, the, um, on the economy itself, the economy is adjusting to the war for the longer term. We do not expect that uh, missiles will disappear two years from now, even if the intensity of the war subsides. So we think the risks of the, you know, it's like... Uh, the right to, hum uh, to air defense is going to be a human right in Ukraine, and it should be a human right in Europe, too, if, you, like, if people are serious about this. It's as important as the quality of drinking water. Um, and um, so you have centers which will, you can protect the entire country. You will have areas which you can protect. Kyiv is reasonably well protected. Russia really tried in May to destroy patriot systems, and they failed. It's very well protected. And so in Kyiv, it's annoying to see the sky light up every night. But, and you know some people will die because they, something will fall somewhere, but it's more or less safe. Whereas that's not the case in front cities, frontline cities, and that's not the case wherever. So the way the economy adjusts is that you either have decentralized clusters, which are well protected by area defense, or you have very decentralized areas where the manufacturing facilities are small enough, they don't present enough uh, interest, you know, sort of one missile per one windmill. You know, it's too expensive to destroy a plant. You know, actually some businessmen I know, some companies are already doing self-insurance, they put 100 windmills far enough that if they get, they can calculate 2% or 3% damage over a year uh, from attacks and, you know, they can live with that. Um, on, so, so, and Ukraine will be integrated in the EU and there will be goodwill. Much will depend on the strengths of politicians to be able to confiscate the Russian assets and pay for the recovery. If these guys have the political will, Ukraine will grow if not, it will be a bit more difficult, okay? But because the damage is substantive, but the money is out there. On Russia, I think people underestimate how deep into a hole Russia got itself with this war. There is all kinds of responsibilities. I don't want to get into politics of it, but there is collective responsibility. People will have to process it. Mariupol, you know, official number, 20,000 people dead. I talked to the mayor, 70,000 people is his estimate. Uh, 70,000 in 400,000 uh, people town have been killed by the Russian military. There'll be some processing about this at some point, and it will take, it's not going to be fast, and that will affect the mood, and it will affect, so we're in a very difficult uh, situation uh, where most of the Russian, you know, military and a lot of Russian population is still oblivious to what's happening. They still, they still think they're on the right side of things. So that process will be slow. So I'm, I'm pessimistic about the, the, the way Russia will come out from this. But it's very difficult to, to, to make predictions. Okay, on this note, it's clear that it's uh, not so optimistic, but uh, it's good that there's a lot to talk about. Uh, I thought it was a very fascinating uh, debate here. Please join me in thanking Timofey Milovanov, uh, Oleg Kitskovsky, and uh, Konstantin